For our next conversation, we're going to look at what the current state is in South Sudan and hear a little bit about a, a personal story and also about what it will take to get to democracy in South Sudan. So please uh, welcome Peter Ajak, founder and director of the Center for Strategic Analysis and Research at the Atlantic Council, and Wala El Sheikh, CEO of Birthright Africa. Wala? Hello, everyone. I am excited to join the Concordia Summit, where later this week, Birthright Africa will be hosting a community discussion on the evolving lexicon uh, of Africa. Uh, please join us then Thursday from 12 to 1 p.m. Eastern. But right now, I am so thrilled to be joined by human rights advocate Peter Biar uh, Jack, who will tell us about his recent uh, imprisonment and release from prison in South Sudan and his view on the path forward towards democracy in the newest country of the world. Uh, Peter is the chairman of South Sudan Young Leaders Forum. Thank you so much. Welcome, Peter. How are you today? Very good. And thank you so much, uh, Wala, for the introduction. And I also thank Concordia for holding this, uh, uh, this summit. Uh, it's wonderful so far. Excellent. So tell us about your background. You have a fascinating story. And where are you today? I'm speaking to you today from Washington, D.C. Uh, I came here uh, just a month ago after escaping a death squad that was sent after me by the president of South Sudan. And this was uh, six months after I was released from prison. I was detained uh, in 2018 uh, until 2020. Uh, I spent most of that time in uh, arbitrary detention, uh, in solitary confinement in a cell where I could not even stretch my body out. I could only curl. Uh, I slept on the floor. You know, there was a lot of torture that was taking place in that detention. Uh, but uh, God was great, great, and uh, I managed to get out of the prison. Uh, and when I left, I came to Nairobi to go through some medical examinations and also to spend some time with my children. But that's when I learned that the president was again after me, and he has sent a hit squad uh, with the intention of either abducting and kidnapping me from Nairobi back to South Sudan or assassinating me in, in Kenya. Oh, wow. And so, but you are safe and sound in the U.S. now, correct? Absolutely. I'm safe in the U.S. and I'm grateful to the U.S. government uh, from leaders from both parties for working so hard uh, to pressure the president of South Sudan uh, to release mm -hmm. me from prison and also for granting, granting me a humanitarian visa uh, that allowed me and my family to come to the United States. Wonderful. We are so glad to hear of your safety. So what is the current political state of South Sudan and how did it come to be that way? Well, you know, the story of South Sudan is extremely tragic uh, to those who have been following it. Uh, you would recall Walla back in 2011, uh, mm -hmm. South Sudan gained its independence. It was a joyous uh, occasion uh, that was celebrated by millions of South Sudanese and many people around the world that stood with us during our long struggle for liberation. Uh, but, yeah. you know, Two years, only two years after that celebration, uh, the leaders of South Sudan, President Salva Kiir and Riyad Machar, then went ahead and plunged the country into a civil war. Uh, and they went around uh, dividing people and rallying support from the ethnic groups. And as you know very well, uh, the two main ethnic groups in South Sudan are the Dinka, from which I come, and, and the Nuer. Uh, and the president and I come from the same ethnic group, and Riyak Machar come from the Nuer ethnic group. So they went around and basically divide people, rallying them uh, along these ethnic lines and reminding them of the tragedies of the past. So then our people butcher each other. And this has been the, the case uh, ever since. Uh, they have tried to sign many agreements in the middle. In fact, they signed 12 peace agreements, uh, but they dishonor every one of them. Uh, the last agreement was 2016, and it collapsed uh, basically after only four months of, of implementation uh, when a war broke out again, which forced Riek Machar to fled from Juba on foot to the Democratic Republic of Congo. 
Now, in 2018, uh, they signed another agreement, and uh, the implementation for that agreement did not even begin until February of this year. And as we speak, they are stuck in the implementations. Uh, they are unable to agree on uh, governors uh, to be appointed and to, to run different parts of uh, southern Sudan. They are unable to uh, uh, reform the military and build a united force. Uh, they are unable to agree on a unified parliament. So right now we are stuck in a situation where our leaders are pretending that there is a peace agreement they're implementing, when in reality, uh, nothing is going on. In the meantime, the economy is entirely decimated uh, because of the drop in the oil prices and the you know, insatiable corruption of the president himself and his cronies. Uh, so South Sudan now is the most fragile state. In fact, two weeks ago, uh, the Social Peace Index released its 2020 ranking of the countries in the world. And, 20, and South Sudan was dead last, uh, scoring 163 out of 163. And it just goes on to show you the extent to which quality of life has deteriorated under the leadership of our current government. Yeah, you know, it was devastating for me to see the the downturn of the peace that was so much the hope for the country. And for me, being a Sudanese, from the northern part, I really saw this as a new chapter for a country that was fighting for over 20 years from, you know, the for economic freedom from the full of Sudan. So, you know, I recently read your article in the Wall Street Journal with your recommendations for the path forward toward democracy. Can you summarize those for us and what you think needs to happen? Absolutely. Uh, you see, as I mentioned, the case of South Sudan is uh, absolutely tragic. Uh, when we gained our independence in 2011, uh, Salva Kiir was basically appointed uh, as president with the objective of laying the ground for uh, institutions, uh, in institutions that would allow the people of South Sudan to then hold democratic elections. Uh, these elections were supposed to take place in 2015. But in 2013, as I mentioned previously, uh, President Kiir and Riyadh Machar plunged the country in, into civil war. And since then, Kiir has used uh, this civil war as an excuse to continuously postpone elections. So the election that was supposed to happen in 2015 were postponed to 2018. When 2018 came, there was still no peace. So he used the same uh, conflict uh, to then postpone the election to 2021. And then mm -hmm. toward the end of 2018, he finally signed a peace agreement with Riyadh Machar. And then the new peace agreement says the election will then be held in 2022. So postpone again from 2021 to 2022. Uh, so now as we speak, is nine years since we gained our independence. We have not had election. There is no clear pathway towards holding elections on time. And right now, President Kiri is also arguing because of the delay in the implementation of peace agreement that he wants the elections to be postponed again from 2022 to 2023 and beyond. So we see mm -hmm. here what is emerging a strategy uh, for him and Riyadh Machar. And it's basically to prevent the people of South Sudan from voting to deny them the rights for which they fought for so long and for which many people around the world supported us because this is, was the reason why we separated from Sudan. It was so that we established our own democratic uh, country uh, that would allow mm -hmm. us to achieve that, those aspirations that we could not achieve in the United Sudan. So what is really needed now is for the world to hold Salva Kiir accountable for all these agreements that he has been making. They have now signed this peace agreement and this agreement clearly states that the elections must be held by March 2022. Of course, it's, it's very late. It would have been 11 years since our independence and no elections. But it's, re it's really now incumbent among, upon the countries uh, that shepherded uh, the independence of South Sudan to take place, particularly the United States, the United Kingdom, Norway, and many countries in the Africa and African Union and bunch of our neighbors that really stood with our people so that we gain that independence. So elections must take place on time. He right now must hold a, a census, uh, appoint new uh, commissioners, and uh, amend the Electoral Act so that those elections take place on time. And if they don't happen on time, he must be held accountable. Uh, we must have a discussion about potentially uh, the Liberian model where Charles Taylor 
after failing Liberia and becoming a source of division, was forced out, which then allowed Liberia to finally hold elections that then allow uh, Ellen Johnson to leave to come to power. I think if, 20, if March 2022 comes and there are no elections in South Sudan, we hope that the world will stand with us and force Salva Kiir to exit so that we can have a real transitional government that will allow our people to vote. Wow, that, that is amazing. If there is any hope for South Sudan, we know that you will be a part of it and we will be watching. Thank you so much for this amazing talk. Thank you very much for the interview.